Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the True to Faith podcast. I'm your host, Cliff Steven. Uh, Dave Barton couldn't join us today. He had to work. But uh, I'm so excited. You know, I'm welcome. I'm excited to welcome Josh Monday from the Josh and Jason Conspiracy podcast. Welcome, Josh. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. So our show is, uh, if you look it up, it's Josh Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. If you hear me, I always introduce it as Josh and Jason Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. What happened is I started the show uh, as Josh Monday Christian Conspiracy Podcast, not knowing my brother was going to be the co-host of every show. So, uh, but I already had a following for my music, so I just I just left it so that people could just search it easier, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so you're going to be doing your biblical flat earth i'm excited i've heard a few times so i'm excited for my uh listeners to hear it because we have a lot of new uh, new people to the conspiracy world and the you know i'm trying to bring people to jesus that's my goal truth to faith that's what happened to me i started getting into the truth of stuff and when i got to flat earth i literally had a spiritual experience where i was in the presence of god and uh, I just want to lead people to that because I think th that is the truth. And mm -hmm. once you're there, you can't unsee it. Yes, I agree. Um, and it's awesome, man. You've been through a lot. You know, I could I could already tell just by the brief brief amount of time that I, I've talked to you. So uh, it's great when you have a testimony like you have, and and people know that you know, even though uh, they're struggling, you know, or they had a, a crazy life that you could that that you could just come to God and and. Everything in your life will start, whatever was broken will start to be fixed. So it's it's definitely amazing. And that's the right way to do it, bro. Bring people Thank to God. You. That's and I yeah. like the name of your podcast too. Well, I was I was going over it. I was trying to figure <laughs> it out. And literally I, I was going into work and I heard a little voice. I, I think it was God, and they just said it, true to faith. And I was like, that's it. I got it. <laughs> that's true to faith. Yeah. Um. So my wife, what happened with my name of my podcast? I, I uh, my wife was telling me you should do uh, should be Christian and conspiracy, and I was like, ah, I don't think that's gonna mix. And then finally, after praying on it, you know, it, it happened. So maybe God just put that in her ear, and uh, you know, that's that's how the name of my podcast came up. So, but yeah, so we'll get into it, man. And uh, so you right now, you you are you biblical flat earther? So you're biblical cosmologist already? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. So no problem. Well, that's gonna work out. So uh I, I, I just started with um John 8, verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen to that. Yeah, and once you know the truth, it like you said, you can't unsee it, and it gets really it's really interesting. So um I always like to start out with uh um Romans 10 verses 17 through 18. So faith comes by hearing the word of God, right? So it says, So when faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, but I say, have you not heard? Yes, verily, there there went into the, all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So it says faith comes by hearing. So if we're uh, hearing the word of God. So if we're talking about these verses right now and everything we're going over and you're Christian and you're, and you're hearing these verses and you're not believing them, then uh, you got you to gotta understand that, you know, what kind of faith is being produced, you know. So when you hear the word of God, it, it produces faith. So we're going to try to do that for you guys here, okay? Obviously, it's the devil's job to take away your faith, right? Because we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, you know, that's that's why what happens is I when I go over some of this stuff, it's hard because uh, the schooling system uh, is is trying to put a block wall between you and, and Gen in the book of Genesis. You know, when they go through all this scientific stuff I'm going to go through, okay? So another one is all scriptures inspired by God. So 2 Timothy 3. 16 through 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scripture is inspired by God. So as I'm going through all these scriptures, know that there's, it's inspired by God. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, right? So if he's the truth, then the truth is important. So everything that we're going through as far as scripturally, we should take it as if it's coming from God's mouth or that, you know, or God inspired it. Right. So um, we need to understand that stuff. All right. Um, another one is first Timothy six, 20 verses or 20 through 21. It says, listen, O Timothy. And this is Paul talking to Timothy, uh, which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings in opposition of science spoke so falsely. So called 
which some professing have errant concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Uh, so uh, that's basically saying there's going to be uh, science that that opposes our faith, you know, that that that's going to come up. And that's that's been happening ever since, uh, you know, the beginning of of uh, of time. You know, I mean, just just some people believe certain thing about the sun, like the sun being a god, you know, or something like that, you know. So that's just one thing. But as they go through, I'm going to show you guys that um, that there's a lot of false science, so-called theories that that have placed on us that we need to understand that are just theories. Cause when I was in school, they, they never taught it like that. They never said that evolution is a theory. They never said that uh, the big bang theory is just a theory. They never said that gravity is just a theory. They just taught it to us as if it's, that's what it is, you know? So yeah. it makes, it makes you as a, a kid just be like, all right, cool. Just put it in the, in the part of your memory that, that that's what it is, what it is, you know? And then when you get taught Genesis or start reading the Bible, you're like, wow, this is way different than what I've been taught. So like I said, it, I think it's meant to put a block wall of faith, you know, because you're not going to have faith in Genesis. How are you going to have faith in Revelation or how are you going to not have faith in all the other books of the Bible? So it's really well, interesting. That, that's what happened to me. I got into ancient aliens and stuff. And um, that eventually, you know, mixed with space in the ever- expanding space it eventually i started doubting god and i i was away from god for a while and then like i said i started going down the truth of rabbit holes and it led me back but i know it's a trick because it tricked me you know yes it yeah, me for a it, it's tricking so many people man if you if you look at people that are in college the the rate of people that are uh you know falling away from the faith you know it's 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 tremendous there's some people that went to seminary school they actually tried to become a pastor and then they went to get their doctorate and they they went through all these classes they had to go through and and that actually separated them from being you know uh for being a uh, uh, christian you know or of the faith they turn atheists because they're like oh they get sucked into all the science that they teach and they feel like that is that is what it is and it separates you so that's a good point um so we also have uh so the Bible, is, it's been proven to stand the test of time, right? Science, it changes like underwear. So we got to understand that. And also another thing that's funny, if you ask some people like, does Joe Biden lie? They would say yes. Does Nancy Pelosi lie? They would say yes. Does the CIA lie? They would say yes. Does the FBI lie? Yes. Do police lie? Sometimes yes. And does sheriffs lie? Yes. But if you ask them, does NASA lie? They would say no, right? Most of them. Well, now some people are actually waking up. But a lot of people, I'm talking about the ones that believe in all this stuff, they would say, no, NASA does not lie. So we got to understand that, you know, CIA have been known to lie throughout time. Government lies. Um, when it comes to money, people lie. And and NASA has like $60 million a day that they're getting, uh, you know, from our tax money. So that's 60 million reasons a day for them to just to keep the lie going. And I'm not saying the people that are in the boardroom that, that are that are not the boardroom, but the people that are in the room uh, doing a simulation of, of a moon landing, whatever they think they're doing. Are, are the liars i'm talking about the people that are at the top the directors the board of directors the, the the government uh i believe they're lying and they're taking that money for black projects or probably funneling it somewhere else that they don't want us to know about right so that's yep. just my opinion um and then uh also uh as as christians we need to filter uh science through the bible and not filter the bible through science you know that's what i believe so uh we don't need to take what doesn't match up with science or with the world and try to just put it in an allegory, uh, you know, put that as an allegory or just poetry or something that is just, uh, you know, like that, you know, there's obviously some things in the Bible that are metaphors or similes. And, and I understand that, but we can't take like the book of Genesis and turn it into an allegory because it doesn't match up with what science tells us. We got to be careful with that. I believe um, I see that a lot, you know, a lot of uh, pastors just say like, well, the reason why it's like this is because this is the way God wanted to tell them because the Israelites believe this way. So that's the way God would tell them. I don't think so. I think God had a blank canvas. And I think when, when we go over these scriptures in Genesis that God had a, a blank canvas, he could tell them whatever he wanted to tell them, you know. Um, yeah. And when Jesus came back, uh, you know, came to the earth, God in the flesh, I think that he would have probably told us that that's the wrong cosmology. This is the way it really is, you know, because. At the time, you know, that the Hebrew Israelites still believed in what I'm about to go over. So um, we got to understand that. Um, and what I what I like to go over 
also is make sure that we're worshiping the creator, not the created. I know a lot of flat earthers out there, they end up um, getting so wrapped up in the flat earth that that's all they talk about is a flat earth. And they stick with that all, all the time. And and they do say that there's a creator, but they don't talk about the Bible or Yahweh or, or Jesus, nothing like that. They just stick with there's a creator out there. Yes, but they, they just teach flat earth every single podcast. I think that we need to concentrate on the creator, you know, concentrate on God, not the created so much. You know, we don't want to worship the flat earth. We just want to show people the scriptures of what it is and lead people to Christ like you're doing on your show, you know. Well, that's and I hear it a lot, like they'll get into flat earth and then they'll get into the Nephilim and they believe the Nephilim. They believe that like they're evil, demonic and they're leading people astray. But then they don't bring up Jesus. And I, I'm like, how do you believe yeah. the bad end, but you don't believe the good end? I don't it just I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it either. And, and they're scared to say that there's a God. They're, they're, they only say there's a creator. Like constantly I hear that. And I'm not putting anybody down. That's a flat earther. I'm just saying that there's a there's a sect of people that I've had on my show and that are out there that, you know, all power to them. They're they're, they're exposing lies and they're doing they are doing truth or stuff, but they just don't get the full 100 percent truth, you know, which is on their nightstand, the Bible. They just I don't know. They're just I I, I totally agree with that. They, they'll bring up the Nephilim and they'll bring up all that stuff, bro. It's like anyways. Yeah, so. Well, and they are doing a good job, like I said, but hopefully we just got to pray for them and, and have them, you know, that they get led to the hundred percent truth. You know, there's a lot of rabbit holes um, and, and they're probably, they're just, they believe in, in, in a creator, but not in God yet. So we just got to pray that that happens. So, um, all right. So first off, what I like to go through before we get into the, uh, the, the biblical portion is I like to show you guys what science says, and then we can compare it to what the Bible says. So, uh, so hold on, give me one sec. Give me one. I'm going to. Are, is this going to be on video or only on uh, on on Spotify so far? Um, do you do Spotify I, video? I haven't started it yet. I, I okay. was going to set up a area soon, but it, either way is fine. Okay. Um. Uh, well, because if I'm gonna, if I would just grab the the so called CGI Earth and just kind of show it like that, but it's all it's all good. It don't matter. All right. So the Earth is at a uh, supposedly at a twenty three point four degree axis, and it's spinning at a thousand miles an hour. So, um. That part, most people would be like, all right, a thousand miles an hour, it's it's massive. They they kind of believe that part. But even some people that believe in the globe, when I tell them that they tell us that we're rotating, I ask them how fast are we rotating around the sun? Most of them have no idea because when we were taught this stuff, we we didn't comprehend these kind of numbers. But so it's rotating around the sun at sixty six thousand six hundred miles an hour, or orbiting the sun. Sorry. So that's an interesting number. Obviously, as a Christian, we know that number six six six. That's in there. So. We got to understand that the fastest bullet travels at 2,600 feet per second or 1,800 miles an hour. So the fastest bullet recorded ever that we have shot is 1,800 miles an hour. So we're basically traveling, orbiting the sun at 30 times faster than a bullet, if this is true. So we got to understand that. That is something we cannot even conceive, right? And um, it's kind of crazy because when I was a kid... I would ride the the you know I'd ride the bus with my dad and I, and I, if I stand up and he's going like thirty miles an hour you know and he makes a turn then I, obviously I'm gonna fall over right um, there was rides at uh at the at the fair where like it's it's called it was called Thriller at the time I don't know what it's called now but it spins in a circle and it you stick against the wall right yeah. so gravity is not like attract us to the center it's pushing us against the wall if it, there was gravity um, and the, and also if there's an earthquake like in Rialto. And I'm over here in, uh, or I'm sorry, earthquake in Riverside. I'm over here in Rialto. I'm going to feel the earthquake. So when the earth moves, I feel it, right? But they're trying to say we don't feel anything. And the speed is not like constant either. It does change a little bit. And also we're we're turning. And then also what we're doing, is, this is something that people don't understand, is we're chasing the sun at 525,000 miles an hour as well. So it's not like we're just, you know, it's not a constant speed of just, you know, of, of going in a straight line, which I can maybe understand us not feeling, but I would think we would still feel it. But it's orbiting. So it's moving in a in a way where you should definitely feel that type of uh, moving because there's no firmament in their model. You know, there's no firmament where it's just blocking all that pressure that we'd feel or all that. Right. So there's that. I actually I actually use that to show my daughter. She's seven. And her her mom don't believe I'm not with her no more. But 
I showed her at the carnival. Like, I'm like, look, that's only going 60 miles an hour and you get stuck on the side and we're supposed to go in a thousand. I'm like, does that make sense? And even like when you see people go up in a plane, they're going, you know, a small, I don't know, let's say Mark one or whatever, their whole face drops. Yes. And that's like not even close to what we're allegedly spinning at. And they're passing out, right? <laughs> Some of them are passing out. They're like, boom, yep. they're out. So yes, exactly. So that's like Mach 10 that they th they say we're going, you know? So we got to understand that that is like, you know, that's just stuff that we can't conceive. And that's, I see a lot of that with the, uh, with the heliocentric model. Right. So uh, another thing they say is that the moon is orbiting us at, at 22,000 or 2,288 miles per hour, which is um, faster than a bullet. Right. So, and if you go outside, what do we see? We see that the earth is fixed and movable. The moon is moving. The sun is moving. And if the moon doesn't seem to be moving, you know, 2,200 miles an hour, I don't know how fast it's moving, but very interesting that they would say that. And also, if you think about how hard it would be to land on that moon that's moving at 2,200 miles an hour, we're orbiting, you know, at 66,600 miles an hour. Do you really think that an astronaut knowing all these numbers and also chasing the sun at at 525,000 miles an hour, you know, half a million miles an hour, do you think that an astronaut's really going to just exit our orbit and go into the moon's orbit and have no problem with it? That sounds insane to me. And to land it on the first try is also insane to me. This is not a moon landing episode. It's a totally different one. But just think about that and keep that in mind. With a computer from the 70s. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah. With the it's computer absurd. from the 70s. And the graphics are even worse right now. I just saw a moon landing the other day from uh, from India. Yeah. And, bro, that was like terrible Atari graphics. That was the worst thing I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm sorry, India. If anybody's from India, I'm not trying to put down your country or anything like that. They're just they're, – our country, too, is doing the same stuff, man. It's all foolery. And, I'm, I'm you know, it's just – now that God is on our side and, and we have the truth they're seeing on us, like it's very hard to deceive us. Not saying we're any better than anybody else, but it's hard to deceive us now because God has, has, has taken the veil off our eyes and now we see it for what it is. And it and it, to me, it looks like um, it looks like a parody when I see the, these type of land moon landings and all this stuff. It's a parody to me like it's a joke. I can't believe that they would even pass it as, as, a, as a, a moon landing. It's crazy. Um, and I'm not saying that the moon can't be landed on. I don't know. I know that it's in the firmament. So I don't know what what the moon is but as we go through the bible i kind of tell you what i you know what i believe it is um so we also have another thing that i think is insane is the closest star it's called alpha centauri it's 4.4 light years away some people might be like okay that sounds good 4.4 light years what is a light year so one light year is six trillion miles away so that means you have to take 4.4 times it by you know six trillion and it comes out to 24 trillion miles away so that's the closest star so to go outside and be able to see these stars with your with your naked eye, to me that's that's crazy. There's a, a inverse uh, square law of light that I don't I don't believe we'd be able to see that star. It, it would have to be like so much bigger than the sun because the sun's ninety three million miles away. So it, it gets crazy, but that's the closest star. But there's some stars that are like uh, one million light years away, you know. So. I mean, that's, that's numbers. I, I don't even, my calculator can't even calculate It's nuts. Um, so I think that's pretty crazy. Um, how far is the closest galaxy? Okay. So the closest galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. So you'd have to take 2.5 million and times it by 6 trillion. And that'll tell you how, how close the closest galaxy is away. So I think that is insane. And, um, so I would ask a Christian that's listening, you know, think about this. How far is heaven then? Right. As I go through these verses, if you think about it, so if we're on this, uh, we're on the earth, you know, just orbiting and we're just a speck of dust, right? In a space vacuum. And um, God says he put the moon, sun and the stars in the firmament, which I'll be going over soon. And then, you know, so if we're on the earth and it's also an ever expanding universe. So if God put all these moon, suns and stars and these supposed galaxies inside the firmament, and let's say that a Christian says that we'll take the, the, the firmament verse literal and there's a firmament outside of all of these galaxies, but it says it's ever expanding. And it says in the Bible that God's throne is above the firmament. 
So that means that God would be moving further and further and further and further away from us. Uh, does that make any sense to me? Not at all. Plus, he'd be trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions of miles away from us, and he'd keep on moving further. I don't believe that that's true. So we'll see as we go through it. Um, do you have any questions so far on anything I've gone over scientifically? No, I, I agree with what you're saying. And I, I think that really is part of the great deception. They want people to believe that God is getting further and further. But yeah. the truth is, he's right up there. I tell my daughter all the time. He can see us. We look like grasshoppers to him, it says Amen. in the Bible. He's right there looking down on us. He he sees everything. Um, we're, we're not just this thing. We came out of the ocean and, you know, through millions of years turned into humans. No, we're special. We're here for a reason. He know every hair on our head is counted down to the last one. We're loved. He loves us. Amen. We are special. I 100% I agree with that. Yeah, that's that's exactly how I feel, too. So. All right. So and, and that's what science is doing. They're, they're moving us further and further and further away from God, you know, so there's that. And then uh, what? So I'm going to go through like a scientific trinity that they have. Uh, one of them is uh, the first one is the Big Bang Theory uh, came from like a Jesuit priest. So as a conspiracy theorist, that should right away give you a, a red flag. When we hear Jesuit, when we hear Freemason, we know like, hey, are you going to take uh, this is actually a Jesuit priest. So. Some people would be like, oh, he's a priest, so we're good. But he says roughly 13.8 billion years ago, uh, it was like the size of a pen, and it exploded into, and, and then all the particles and stuff came together, right, because of gravity, right, the, the lowercase g god for them. So what it is is uh, when I was in the military, I never, ever saw a an explosion cause construction, uh, I always saw it cause destruction. I had to watch so many videos of explosions because they don't want that. What you know is that if the explosion could see you, then then you're going to be able to hit shrapnel. So I was watching explosion videos and everything explodes. I never seen anything come back together. Like if a library explodes, it doesn't come back together. The books come back together. You know, if I saw stuff like that in, in, in our reality, then I would probably say, hey, maybe the Big Bang Theory maybe could be true. If I saw something massive explode like the World Trade Center and then all of a sudden it just came back because of gravity, then that makes me that makes more sense to me. But they're saying that it exploded and everything came together, you know, and 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 they need all these billions upon billions of years because they need evolution to be true. Right. So that's why they create this uh, nonsense theories. Um, the next uh, part of the scientific journey would be evolution. Um, that's another one. So uh, that's that's why they need those. Uh, trains upon trains of or billions upon billions of years, right? So, um, evolution. We have Charles Darwin. His grandfather was the one that actually came up with the theory of evolution. He's a 33 degree Mason. His uh, that that grandfather's son was a preacher, so he didn't come with it. But his grandson, uh, Charles Darwin, actually took that that theory of evolution and he brought it to the mainstream, right? So he took it, tried to uh, refine it, and then you know sold it to the public, and the public bought it. Uh, even though at the time a lot of the the Christians were were having problems with, the, with evolution, the scientific field you know bought it and then they they just went with that you know and uh, I know maybe some things I, I would say on a a, mi a minor level evolve like let's say like if you have a mutation in, in in like DNA I think the same species maybe you know sometimes that's obviously happening you know but as far as a species turning into another species which would be macroevolution. I, I think you would probably agree. We're not seeing that type of stuff. Even in the fossil records, we're not seeing, uh, you know, a fish turn into a wolf or a, or a, a tree turn into a, a person. You know, we're not seeing anything like that, especially right now. We're not seeing that. So um, I think that, you know, as they're studying all this stuff and, and also the fossil records, you know, if you have a flood, uh, like the Bible says, it's going to, you know, it's obviously going to mix stuff up in, in a certain way that, with the, where the evolutionists or the paleontologists and all that—they're not—they're not looking at there there being a, a worldwide flood. They're just acting like there wasn't, and everything's just put in these levels. So, study that. That's another thing that's putting a lot of people away from God for sure. You know, the Bible says that everything comes after its kind in Genesis. But go ahead, bro. Well, I'm not—I'm not trying to put this guy down, but Rogan loves to. You know, show monkeys using sticks and saying, "Look, that they're they're evolving. They're they're in the um the Stone Age where we were." And it's just it cracks me up. He he loves showing monkeys using sticks. Like 
yeah and and comparing it to evolution and i'm just like bro it, it's just using a stick like yeah they, they have pretty big brains but they'll never be us you know yeah. they'll never turn into humans it's not happening yes and uh you'll see why he's so popular you know because it's the, the way he's he's he's, he's you no know, doesn't have god in his show whatsoever uh once in a while he have like jordan peterson on or have somebody and uh you know you, you're not seeing him talk about god but does he a great podcaster yes does he have great ideas yes uh, does he is he cool in the scene? Yeah, and he's a UFC announcer, cool. But yeah, we'll have to pray for him. Uh, it'd be amazing if he if he had a conversion, you know, and actually saw the the truth. Um, it's hard when you get a hundred fifty million dollars from Spotify, uh, for you to start talking about Jesus. You know, it's gonna be a tough thing for him. Yeah. But, uh, to, to, but uh, the next one in the in the Trinity Scientific Trinity is gonna be the heliocentric globe. Uh, sorry, the heliocentric model. It's not the heliocentric globe. Heliocentric model, and the person that came up with that in the beginning was Copernicus. Uh, they have a Freemason lodge named after him at CHP 246. Uh, they say he's a known occultist. As far as locking him into uh, being a, a a Freemason, it was kind of it's tough for me to find out 100. I had Gary Wayne on my show. He said he was definitely a Freemason. Uh, him having a lodge named after him, I'm I'm sure he was a Freemason. Uh, but he's another one that that was a, a priest, a Catholic priest. Uh, and on his deathbed, that's when they released the Copernicus model, our heliocentric model. He was uh, trying to hold back on it because um, a lot of the people at the time, like John Calvin, um, all these people were saying that, um, and then, uh, dang, I forgot the other guy's name, but all of them were saying that this is coming straight from Satan. It's satanic, you know, that to have the sun enthroned in the middle. And and the way his writings are, like uh, Copernicus, it says, in the middle of all sits the sun enthroned in the most beautiful temple. Could we have placed this luminary in any better position in which he can illuminate the whole at once? He is rightly called the lamp, the mind, the ruler of the universe, Hermes. Uh, just as you go through his writings, it says he's, he call him the all seeing. Uh, the sun sits upon the royal throne. OK, this is the type of uh, speaking of um, and it says the earth has the moon at her service. Uh, speaking of the of the earth being like a her, speaking of the the sun being like a he, they do do that in the Bible. Doesn't doesn't call the earth a her, but that does say he in the Bible. But as you kind of see, his writings are talking about the sun kind of being like a god, right? And as you go into all these different um, religions, you're gonna see like uh, the sun god, uh, you know, uh, Mithras, uh, Roman, you know, Saturn, Mars, all these different. They're, they're worshiping the skies. It talks about not doing that, you know in the Bible, don't worship the skies, you know? So that was, that's what was happening. And I believe he was trying to turn the sun into a God. Like we need the, we need the sun so that we can have life. We need the sun so that we can have light, you know? So they want to change the sun into the S U uh, N instead of the S O N, you know, basically even back. Exactly. Then. Yep. So, um, and then Isaac Newton, also a known, known occultist uh, as well. Uh, he did write some stuff for the, for the, uh, Christian community, so people like that are Christian will be like, no, he was Christian, but uh, the truth was that yeah, he was actually an occultist. So look into that, um, and you know, I, it, it gets really interesting. So now, now that we're we're at the point where we're gonna kind of bring up the Bible section of it, so that's the scientific part. Um, if you guys want to just study that, just find out exactly what the what the scientists are saying, um, then you know, kind of look into that, and and then you guys will it'll you can almost disprove it just by studying that you know because now that you have discernment you're christian and you see that some of the stuff is insane uh you'll you'll see that it's, it's crazy man how, how they're trying to pull this uh the wool over our eyes any questions on anything i've gone over so far bro no you, you you're doing a great job okay let's uh all right let's do this so now we now now that we're going to go over the bible Let's understand that Jesus said this, okay? This is in John 5, 45 through 47. Uh, he says, do you think that I shall accuse you to the Father? There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus is saying to believe Moses' writings. So what are what are part of Moses' writings? It would be the five books of the Torah, Genesis uh, through Deuteronomy, uh, uh, Leviticus, all, all these different parts of the Bible, right? The, the five first books, the Torah, okay? So let's think about this, okay? So if he's saying that, then let's make sure that when I read Genesis that he's saying to believe the words of Moses, right? Jesus is saying that. 
uh, you know, we're Christians. So what is Jesus to us? Most of us that Jesus is God, right? So if you believe in the Trinity, if you don't believe in the Trinity, no matter what, who's an important figure in Christianity, Christ, right? Jesus. So let's understand that. All right. So let's imagine that Moses, uh, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, right? It talks about that. And he's speaking to God, right? So God is able to, this is in the Bible, right? So God is able to speak to him. So he gave him like the law. He gave him all these, you know, Genesis. We got to understand when, when Genesis is written, Moses was not alive during Genesis. So what does this have to be? This has to be a firsthand account from God, because even the stuff about Abraham, even the stuff about Joseph, like how would Moses know that type of stuff? Uh, he's not just going to be writing it. God has to tell him this to write it, right? When God talks about creating the earth to Moses, this is a firsthand account from God. And and like I said, God had a blank canvas. He could say whatever he wanted to say to them. So um, so let's start out with um, let's start out with Genesis. So day one, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heavens would be uh, Shemaim, so that's plural, uh, and then the earth would be like land, okay? So earth in Hebrew means land. It doesn't mean like earth. So when you think about earth, you're thinking that he created the heavens and the earth. You're going to think of probably this big globe, but think about it. It says the heavens and the earth, and then it says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So uh, this is where I believe personally, I don't believe in the gap theory. I just believe what, what God did is he created the sky where the moon, sun, and the stars would be and and the, and the heavens, which would be where his throne is located, right? That's day one. And then the earth that, he, that he, they said he created, I think he created the foundations. So if you look at the flat earth model, the foundations would be the bottom where the dirt is. And also Sheol is in the, in, in the earth. So I think he created Sheol and the abyss that he blocks the angels in. He created all that, I believe, uh, in, in the beginning. So it's not heavens and the globe. What it means is the sky, heaven where his throne is located, and the land, the foundations of the earth. The reason why I believe this is because angels were clapping when God made the, laid the foundations of the earth. And foundations is, is spoken upon plenty of times in the Bible, right? So this is what I believe. I'm not saying you have to believe that, but that's what I believe God did. So that's the first day. Day two, God created the firmament. He separated the waters from the waters, and he also called the firmament heaven. And the firmament in the Bible is, is uh, I'll go over the firmament. I have a whole section on it. But once we go over that section, just understand the firmament, right? It's it's firm, right? It's hard. It's uh, it's solid. It's molten glass. It's, uh, it's beaten out. It's like a bowl, right? So that would be the firmament. Another word you could use is dome. And in the old, old Catholic Bible, long time ago, they used dome. That's the word they use for firmament, rakia. Uh, in the yeah. Greek, it's stereoma. So he separated the waters from the waters. So if I always had to separate waters, if there was waters on the outside and I had this plastic, that's what separates the water from the waters. You need something hard, right? Solid. And there's waters up in heaven. Understand that. So that's the, that's day two. And he called the firmament heaven. So that's the second heaven. The first heaven is where the sky, where the moon, sun, and the stars are located. The third heaven would be would be where God's throne is located above the firmament, right? So just letting you guys know that. Now, day three, God created the oceans, the dry land, plants, and vegetation. So that means on day three, the continents were formed, the seas were formed, and also uh, the plants and vegetation. So that came before the sun. Very interesting. Now, everything is laid out right now. Uh God has it laid out, and now he places the moon, sun, and the stars on day four in the firmament. So in the firmament, right? So right now I'm standing in the room. So those moon, sun, and the stars are in the firmament. So understand that. So what was the earth rotating around, you know, in the heliocentric model on day three? You know, if the sun was not even created yet. Now, if you go to science, what they tell you is that the stars were created first 13.6 billion years ago. And then uh, then the, they said that the moon was created after that, or the moon could have been created after the earth was, was formed. But what they say is that the stars were formed, uh, the sun 4.6 billion years ago, then 4.5 billion years ago, the earth was formed is what they say. Okay, so even in the heliocentric model, the way that everything was created is, is different than what the Bible says, because the Bible says that the earth 
the sky, the firmament was formed first, and then and then the moon, sun, and the stars were formed, right? That's when the and God says the stars also as if they're nothing. And he separates a star from a sun. Uh, in the scientific, they also try to tell you that the sun is a star and the star is a star, right? So God separates those two. You need to understand that. So that's something that you can ask somebody that's a heliocentrist, uh, theistic evolutionist, whatever they are, and they're still a Christian. What was the sun rotating around on day three? They'll probably tell you, well, God could do whatever, you know, but it doesn't sound like he made it the way that they said, you know. So uh, another thing they say, you want any questions so far? I'll let you comment. No, you I was like. going to say, um, <clears throat> yeah, because when my friend did the co-host, when he talked about Flat Earth, from all the programming, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. But then I started, you know, listening to your podcast, listening to uh, Flat Earth Files with George Hobbs. So I started coming around and he's like, come look at this GoPro video. And he showed me the GoPro and then it hits the firmament, stops moving 75 miles up. And it kind of tilts sideways and you can see the moon and the sun. They're right. They're right there. You know, they're not millions of miles away. And yeah. that's when I had my spiritual awakening because it, it was so obvious and it was like, boom, it hit me so hard. Like I went outside, I couldn't breathe. I was like, oh. You know, it blew my mind. And then that's when I had the experience with God. So, yeah, no, it all lines up. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Once you, and like I said, once you see, it's like, it, it's hard for them to pull the wool over your eyes after that. So, uh, so like I said, so I believe that the earth is, 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 is fixed and immovable. Like the Bible says, here's a couple of verses that backed it up. It says that, um, first Chronicles 16, uh, 30, it says he has fixed the earth firm and immovable Psalms 93, one that was fixed. The earth immovable and firm Psalms 96, 10. He has fixed the earth firm and immovable uh, Psalms 104, five that was fixed. The earth on its foundation. So it cannot be shaken. Isaiah 45, 18, who made the earth and fastened it himself and fixed it fast. Um, Isaiah 48, 13, mine has also laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand has spanned the heavens that I call them to them, they stand together. So I believe the, the earth is fixed and immovable, right? And um, it's interesting when I get into Genesis, um, what he, what God says about the firmament and everything and how he placed everything. So here's another interesting thing. I know you've probably studied the flat earth, so you know about uh, certain things that, that uh, you know, like the Antarctica being on the outside, uh, the waters, like the oceans needs a, a containment, right? So uh, it's interesting that the way God explains this in Proverbs 8, 27 through 29, it says, when he established the heavens, I was there, uh, it says wisdom is in quotations. When he drew a circle upon the face of the earth, when he made firm, the skies above firm, meaning hard, solid, right? Um, and when the fountains and springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set the sea, its boundaries so that the waters would not transgress. His command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So the seas have a boundary. What are the boundaries of the sea? Uh, for us, uh, it's the Antarctica, right? And I'm not 100% that this model is true either. I'm just saying that this is what they've came up with. Uh, there's a Mercator map where the Antarctica is on the outside. There's flat earth maps where Antarctica is on the outside. So I do believe that God did set the seas. It's boundary. It's boundary would be uh, Antarctica, Right. And that's what we see when they when you they go up to Antarctica, there's a there's a giant ice wall. Uh, and and, uh, and it's it just really interesting the way that that verse is laid out. And it actually matches up with what uh, we're seeing with flat earth maps and, and, and certain things like that. Right. So very interesting. Um, another thing that, you know, as I went through verses uh, one through as I went through uh, day one through four, that matches up. It says that uh, the moon and the sun are moving in the Bible. Right. So we have Joshua 10, verses 12 through 13. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged uh, themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, has not go down about a whole day. When it says go down in the Hebrew, that means go away from. And if it's come hence, that means it's come forth. That means it's coming towards them, right? So uh, when it says go down, people would be like, well, it's going down, right? 
but it actually means to go away from in the Hebrew. I, I learned that from um, Rob Skiba actually was going over that. Very interesting, man. So, but also in the book of Jasher, it does talk about the sun standing still. The book of Jasher is um, extra biblical text. So it talks about that. And then um, there's also, they want to, they want to have two witnesses in the Bible. Uh, well, Habakkuk 311 also says that the sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of thine arrows and thy wind and at the shining of thy glittering spear. So we have Habakkuk 311, the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Very interesting. So he's, they're talking about the sun and the moon moving and God stopping them for 24 hours or however long it took them to avenge their enemies. Let me see. It says, it says about a whole day and it's stopping in two geographical locations. I thought that was interesting as well. So in, in our model, the earth is still and the moon and the sun are moving. So right here, the Bible is saying that the moon and the sun were moving. There's also another verse that talks about the sun moving back 10 degrees backwards. It's uh, Isaiah 38, seven through eight. And this is the sign to you from the Lord and the Lord will do this thing, which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow of the sundial, which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So you could say, go away from with the sun on the sundials of Ahaz, 10 degrees backwards. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial, which it had not had gone down or gone away from, right? Very interesting. So we have three, three there that we're talking about the sun moving. There's a fourth one that I'll go over in a little bit, but I have to, I kind of bring up, uh, tombstone of one of the national director nasa directors before i go over that section but there's three four verses in here that talk about the moon and sun moving that i have there's there's actually more of them that i don't have written down but i like to go over those uh three um and another thing that i think is very interesting is that it says that the moon is a light and the sun is a light you know it's, it's talking about two great lights uh so i think they're they're separate it, it seems to say so um, that also goes against science, right? So this is Genesis 1, verses 14 through 19. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and them from, uh, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the fourth day uh, and the evening and morning were the fourth day. So it says that there's two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Uh, in the scientific model, the sun is reflecting off of the moon and the moon is providing us light. That's the way they say it happens. And sometimes in the day, I'm not going to lie, sometimes it does look like maybe maybe the sun is shining off of it. You know, I mean, I just see certain certain ways. But, so, dude, you, if you take a picture of this of the moon, bro, it's so bright, dude, it looks like a bright light. Sometimes you see that uh, there's clouds that are lit around the moon only, not like the whole uh, sky is lit. So, it you know, there's there's it looks to me like the moon is a light. Is it landable? I don't know. Is it plasma? I have no idea. I don't know about all that stuff. I just try to go with what the Bible says. It says that the moon is its own light. Very interesting. And also it says that God placed the moon, sun, and the stars in the firmament. So there would have to be the firmament and, and those moon and stars are inside of it and they are moving, right? And we are fixed and immovable. That's what we have so far. Um, here's a few verses that talk about the moon being its own light. And then have you heard about that experiment too, bro, where they where they 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 test the the shade of the moon as opposed to the light from the moon? And the light from the moon is actually colder than the shade of the moon, which is opposite yeah. of what the sun is. Yeah, I've seen that. That's cool. It pro it proves what the Bible says. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, because giving her light, her light is colder, right? So it's really interesting. So we have that. Um Ezekiel 32 7. And when I shall, th this one is uh, talking about the moon being her light. It says, um, Ezekiel 32, 7 says, And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with the cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. Um, there's tons of verses that, that I could go over where it talks about the moon having a light, right? So it, it's really interesting. Next up, I want to discuss the firmament, right? This is, this is something that in the flat earth community, 
uh, it's getting, some people believe in the biblical firmament. Some people believe that it's like, if it's it is flat, some people believe that it's just, uh, it's not like a solid dome, that it's uh, some kind of, you know, whatever different kind of material, some kind of water only. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, thoughts on the firmament. We Obviously, we don't know 100% because we can't go up there. So, but keep in mind that the moon, sun, and the stars are in the firmament. Um, I kind of talked about it earlier. Firmament means rakia in the Hebrew. And then in the Greek, it's stereoma. And if you talk to someone and, you know, what does stereoma mean? It's it's going to mean solid, right? In the Greek or in the Hebrew, uh, it means beaten out, uh, molten glass, uh, solid, uh, you know, firmament, right? There is a uh, something that someone says that is it expands, right? That's what they try to use in different versions, you know, expanse, which would be, which would kind of go with the heliocentric model. But firm, you know, firmament, why would they use firmament, right? Why would they even use that when they when they translate the Bible? Because it's supposed to be firm. Um, and also above it, he separated the waters from the water. So above the firmament, you're going to have waters. And then above that would be God's throne. And it, and it talks about it being like a crystalline, uh, like glass, you know, uh, and then God's throne. And, and it talks about like rainbows. It talks about like um, uh, Jasper, Sapphire, all these different things in heaven, you know, so it's going to be beautiful and amazing, but we got to understand that. Uh, and also in Revelation, it talks about hearing uh, roaring sounds of thunder in heaven and roaring sounds of water because there's water, you know, so got to understand there's water below, b below God's throne. It's really interesting. I'm not saying in heaven it's going to be filled with just water, but there's water, you know, uh, above the firmament. So there's water there, right? Um, one of the theories on the firmament that someone that, uh, you know, I, I think does a great job of breaking down biology and, and evolution uh, as far as like going against evolution with the Bible is Ken Hoven. And his theory was that the firmament was a, that, that God speaking of here in Genesis was just a solid piece of ice. Uh, canopy that's around the globe and um what he said is when the flood happened then the water came down on the earth and and the ice melted and uh that's why the people live longer because the sun wasn't able to penetrate through this supposed ice but what he forgot to read is that god put the moon sun and the stars in the firmament so that piece of ice would have to be outside of the galaxy or outside of you know, it, it, outside where the moon, sun, and the stars are inside of it. So there would have to be two firmaments for that to be true. And obviously there's not because the Bible in Genesis 1, 8 or 1, 6 says, And God said, let there be a firmament, only one firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, right? So, and they also called the firmament heaven. So is he saying that one of the, the heavens melted? Uh, if that was true, then uh, when they talk about, when Paul talks about going to the third heaven, then that wouldn't make any sense, right? So we got to understand that. Also, another thing we need to understand is that uh, when, when, when God is speaking, it, it seems like like we were talking about the earth is made for us. So it says, um, let them be for, let the lights in the sky, let, let them be for, for signs, for seasons, for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. So the stars are made for lights upon the earth. The moon is made for lights upon the earth. The sun is made for lights upon the earth. So in our model, there, the, the earth is, is a lot bigger because it's, it's instead of it being a globe, it's actually, you know, it's flat with, with ridges and mountains. Yes. But, and then this, and then the, the firmament would be uh, connecting to the earth. Right. And then the moon, sun, and the stars are in the firmament. So God made the earth for us right and he made the moon sun and the stars to light up the earth not to light up galaxies and 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 different planets and all this different stuff uh, you know it doesn't sound like that the way that this language is is that god made the earth special for us we need to understand that right so well, any i believe, <clears throat> I believe like in the bible it talks about when god flooded the earth it says that it opened like a scroll you know, and if you picture a scroll, it's like flat and it's rolled up. So he rolled it up and then that's how he flooded the earth. Yeah. Um. So the part where he says it opened like a scroll is in Revelation. He's talking about when Jesus comes, he's going to open the, the heavens like a scroll. Oh, so yeah. that one, but it's okay. But he does talk about opening the windows of heaven with the flood. And then, and then the waters came in from heaven. And also it talks about it raining for 40 days and 40 nights. 
and it talks about the waters coming from the great deeps in the spring. So there's three different events there that happen. If you go to church, they're going to tell you that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and it flooded the earth. That doesn't make sense on the globe. But on the flat earth, it talks about the moon, sun, and the stars being in the firmament. It talks about the uh, the, the windows of heaven opening, which would be the firmament. The, the firmament is called heaven. I even just talked about it right here in, Gen in Genesis 1-6. So the, the windows of heaven open. And if it's a dome, right, uh, think of it like a fishbowl. All he has to do is just fill up the waters above uh, uh, Mount Everest. That's the highest point of Earth, supposedly. I don't know what it is. but uh, So the waters just have to fill up above the Antarctica and above Mount Everest, and all of the Earth would be flooded in this contained zone. But if you talk about the Earth being rotating, all this stuff, and it raining for 40 days and 40 nights, that doesn't make sense, dude, at all. You know, and yeah. if and if the if the also if there was ice around the earth with the heliocentric model like Ken Hopeland's talking about, they said if the ice melted, it, it would cause d massive destruction. I don't I don't know exactly what the uh what that would be like. I'm not science minded as much as some people, but it just doesn't make sense. So we gotta understand that as Christians, okay? And um there's also another verse, Isaiah 55, 8. It says, My thoughts are not like yours. Yours are not like mine. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So uh, earth and then heaven, right? So they're just talking about, you know, it's it's a little, it's higher than the earth. But um, there's verses that are in the Bible where it's talking about like God's throne being above the firmament, right? So I have to go over that. Um, another thing we got to understand is uh, our, our body is, it turns into spirit, right? So when, when we die, uh, Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? So when we die, our spirit is able to travel through the firmament and go to heaven, or it's able to travel into the earth and go to Sheol or hell, right? So angels are going to come get you like like in uh, in one of the, the stories that Jesus was telling was about Lazarus and the rich man. It talks about them dying and angels coming to grab them and taking them where they're supposed to go immediately, right? So we need to understand that. But our body right mm -hmm. now is solid. We can't travel through the firmament and go to heaven. We can't. There's there's no way to do that. But when you turn to spirit, you're able to go through the firmament and go to heaven, right? So that kind of makes sense. It's it's interesting. Um, and uh, also that says when Jesus came back and he resurrected, he was able to walk through the wall. He didn't have to walk through the door and open the door. He was able to walk through the wall. So, you know, he, you, you could go through the firmament, right? And he he ascended to heaven, right up to heaven. He went through the firmament, right? So uh, we have that. And why do you think the Tower of Babel was was so important? You know what what was the what was the deal with that? Um, God didn't. What they wanted to do is they wanted to build the Tower of, of ba Babel up to heaven, and they wanted to kill God. Like they they hated God because they say he killed the hit their ancestors the nephilim and and they wanted to kill god they wanted to go to heaven also and try to get with angels again and create nephilim as well so there's a lot of stuff there but you know the tower of babel you know that's a bunch of uh mystery religions trying to get to heaven right so god obviously changed the the um the languages and made made it so that there were babel right they couldn't speak so that's like babylon right but understand how are they going to have, if he's not going to let them go to heaven, how is he going to let some Freemason, you know, three Freemasons uh, hop onto a, a rocket and fly to the moon? You know, he ain't going to allow that either. So that stuff's not happening, you know? So uh, another thing we have is Job 37 through 18. Uh, this is talking about the firmament. It says, hast thou him spread out the sky, which is strong as molten looking glass. So it's talking about the sky being strong as molten looking glass, right? The firmament. And uh, also, I thought it was this was interesting in, in Isaiah 14, 13 through 15. It says, for have you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. He's talking about Satan. These are like the five I wills. Satan says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the Mount congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend, excuse me, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then uh, it says, yet you shall be brought down to shield to the lowest depths of the pit. So that's giving you an, an idea that God's throne is above the stars, right? Because it says, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will also sit on the Mount congregation, the farthest sides of the north. 
Now, what we have in the in the flat Earth is in the North Pole, which we're not allowed to to visit, and the South Pole we're not allowed to visit by ourselves. So, in the North, some people believe that God's throne, which if you if there was a dome, it would make sense that God's throne would be in the middle in the North, right? And that uh, that's why I think sometimes people say they see aurora borealis. Some people say that that might be uh, from God's throne. Who knows? That's just kind of speculation, but uh, it gets interesting. But uh, he says that he will as, as exalt his throne above the stars of God. So you know <laughs> that God's throne is above the firmament. Uh, Am Amos 9, 6 is another one. It says the one who builds his upper chambers. This is the NASB 2020 version. I don't really read that version, but the way that they uh, the way that they interpreted this was interesting. It says the one who builds his upper chambers in the heavens it says, and has founded his vaulted dome over the earth he who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth the lord is his name just the way that they talk about that he built his upper chambers in the heavens and and he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth very interesting the way that they uh interpreted that verse so there would be the dome and then he's walking the chambers of heaven which is above the watchers right and his throne is above that um there's another one here that kind of puts down the the whole Ken Ken Hoven theory. It's Psalms 148 verses one through four. It talks about there still being waters above the heavens. This is even after the flood. You know, David speaking here. Um, this is after the flood. It says, "Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the uh, the heavens." I'm sorry. This is the Psalms. Of, this is Psalms. I'm sorry. Um, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him. Uh, all his angels, praise ye him, all his hosts, praise ye him, sun and moon, praise him, all ye stars of light, praise him, ye the heavens of heavens, and the waters that be above the heavens, right? So he's talking about waters still being in the uh, above the heavens. So Ken Hovind, that theory would go out the window if you read this verse, because the waters would no longer be above the heavens if there was a ice sheet and water above that, and it just melted in, during the flood, right? So any any questions about anything I've gone over so far, bro? No, it's spot on. And even though I've heard you give it, you know, here every time I hear it, it's like, you know, it's still like I get excited, blows my mind. Yeah, man, you're killing it. I appreciate it. No problem. This is yeah. So if, since you've heard it, this is kind of for your audience to understand and, and, and definitely go back and read these verses. I like to tell you what verse we're going through so you can go and read it in different forms. And, and you know, if you King James version is most of these verses that I'm going over. So. Uh, we have Ezekiel 10, 1. It says, then I looked and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as a, as a sapphire stone, as the appearance of likeness of a throne. So it's talking about, Ezekiel's talking about looking up, seeing the cherubim, and then above that, above the firmament, it says that um, as the appearance of likeness of a throne. So that's saying Ezekiel believed that God's throne was above the firmament, and Ezekiel was able to talk to God. He was a prophet from God, so we should probably take his words and 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 listen to that, right? Um, another one is, is Ezekiel one twenty six. This one says, "Above the firmament, there was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of an appearance of a man above upon it." So he's talking about the throne, the, the throne being above the firmament in this verse as well. Um, so, and it also talks about sapphire stone. Sapphire could come in any color but red, which is kind of interesting because everybody acquires, you know, they, they they put red to the devil, right? But sapphire could be any color but red. So it could have been blue. It could have been uh, green. We don't know what they're talking about here, but green would kind of make sense with the the whole the North uh, Aurora Borealis lights or whatever. Um, we have that, and then. Uh, Another one is another one is Ezekiel 8, 3. He says, he stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the north gate of the inner court, which was seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. So he's talking about like grabbing a lock of his hair, bring him up to where the earth and heaven, right? So it's between earth and heaven. So you kind of see there that... um that you know, there's there's a correlation between earth and heaven. It's not like he was brought up, you know, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of miles away. No, it just sounds like heaven is is local. It's close, you know, a lot closer than what they're trying to tell us. Um, another one we have is Psalms 150 verses one through two. 
Praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmament of his power, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness. So praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, and praise him in the firmament of his power. So the sanctuary is above the firmament. That's Dave, or, uh, David talking again right there. Um, when I talk to you about the crystalline uh, you know, glass, it says in Revelation 4, 6, which you give a get a view into heaven. Revelation 4, 6, it says, Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So um, what I say is, everybody calls God the most high. Why do they call him the most high? Well, because he's at the highest point of creation. If his throne is above the firmament, and the moon, sun, and the stars, and everything is in the firmament, then God's throne is, he is actually literally the most high. That's why they call him that. Isaiah calls him that. Um, there's angels in the Bible that call him the highest. So, you know, he's actually the highest point of creation. Everything is built below him, right? So I think yeah. that's interesting. Um, so any any questions on the firmament or anything that I've gone over so far? No, it's, it's spot on, though, like you said. Like, it, it, you know, seeing it now with clear eyes, like, it just makes perfect sense. Like, he is the most high. He's the top of creation. <laughs> You know, it just it makes perfect sense now, you know, of why they call them that, you know. So and then yep. so uh, have you heard of Operation Fishbowl? If you've heard this presentation, you probably have. <laughs> so. Yep. All right. So Operation Fishbowl, uh, the original name is Dominique Chama. It's uh, Operation Fishbowl was a series of high altitude nuclear tests in 1962 that was carried out by the United States as a part of a larger uh, Operation Dominique Chama. And if you look up what. um. Uh, so basically, nuclear weapons are, are shot into the air. Uh, some of what was called like the Thor missile. So think about that. They're trying to shoot Thor into the sky and break the, the what is called Dominique. It means belonging to the Lord. And then Chama means fixed shell. So if you think about it, they're trying to take Thor missile and they're trying to break the fixed shell belonging to the Lord, which is which is the firmament. So I believe that, that that's what they were trying to do back then trying to blow up the firmament, trying to blow a hole in the firmament. And there was different, um, there was like, um, uh, there was like Russia, America, all these different countries all involved in doing this, trying to break the fixed shell belonging to the Lord, but it doesn't work. So if you guys want to look those up, you'll be able to see that that was in 1962. Mm -hmm. That's close to when, when all this stuff was happening, like um, Admiral Byrd, 1959, going to for um, Operation Deep Freeze, and uh, Operation High Jump going to Antarctica, him coming back saying that he found extra land as big as the United States with resources uh, beyond Antarctica. That was kind of interesting. Uh, that happened in 1962, Operation Fishbowl. So now they know that there's a dome. So now they're trying to break the dome, do whatever they can to break through it. I thought that was interesting. And then NASA comes, all this propaganda that we're going to be able to go to the moon, going to be able to go to Mars. And then in 1969, supposedly the moon landing happened, and that that like solidified for a lot of people that that were a globe, and solidified that space is what they say it is instead of being what the Bible says it is. So understand that that section of time was when it just everybody got so indoctrinated by that moon landing, it was insane. And and that, as we know now, a lot of people are waking up to that 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 was just all. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Admiral Byrd, when he started, you know, talking about this stuff, you know, then he shortly after he ends up dead. Yep. And the Antarctic Treaty comes. Yeah, and his brother know, was a big saying. part of the Antarctic Treaty. His brother is a senator. Admiral Byrd is also a Freemason. His senator uh, brother was also a Freemason. So his brother was the one that took the Antarctic Treaty, brought it in, and he was pushing for it, pushing for it. Obviously, you know, I think that they found out that there was a dome or they found out there was extra land that they don't want people to know about. Right. So I, and on the globe, it doesn't make sense if there's extra land, above, you know, beyond Antarctica that, cause they're not, that doesn't make sense to us, but on a, you know, on a flat earth, then it, it would, it would make more sense, you know? So I thought that was yeah. interesting. Uh, another thing. So back then when all that stuff is happening, we also have, um, you know, Warner Von Braun, uh, n a Nazi scientist that came over from um, operation, uh, paperclip we got to understand that that is uh you know nazi scientist he's brought over what what america did with operation paperclip is they they took all these people and they put them in high places what russia did is they took these scientists they brought them to russia figured out what they knew 
They they knew that they, they were like, hey, we already know most of the stuff. They sent them back to Germany, and then America went and grabbed those scientists too. So America took all these scientists, whether they were bad, good, doesn't matter. We took them, we put them in like you know North Grumman, all these different you know CEOs, and 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 also they took like uh, Warner von Braun, who was a rocket scientist, and they put him into he they put him as the director of NASA or like the higher up of NASA. So and they used the in uh I thought it was interesting because Warner von Braun. Um, when he passed away, they said that he had a conversion in 1966, very interesting number, but, uh, or when he was, I'm sorry, when he was 66 years old, uh, he, he ended up converting to Christ is what they said. And on his tombstone, he left us like a breadcrumb, I think for us to kind of go into the Bible and understand that, that it's different than what they were saying it was. Um, so Psalms 19 one is what was on his tombstone. This is the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show it this handiwork. That is right. There is a great statement. Like, wow, that, that question is kind of what science says. And also it's crazy that he said that, that the firmament show it this handiwork. But if you keep continue reading, I think it's a breadcrumb for you to go to this verse and continue reading. It's even more interesting. So Psalms 19 one through six, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, the night unto utter sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language nor voice that is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And whom hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth the strong man to run a race. He is going forth as from the end of the earth are from the end of heaven and is circuit under the ends of it. And they're hid from nothing there, the heat thereof. So what he's saying is that the sun goes in like a circuit, which like, if you run a race, you start at one point, you end at another. So it's talking about the sun moving around the earth. It's talking about it being in a, in a, in a tabernacle, which I thought was interesting. So this whole verse is talking about the sun moving and not the earth. So I just think maybe he left a breadcrumb for us to kind of start reading into that, you know? Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. You know, his whole life work was rockets and stuff. And then he puts that. And to me, you know, being growing up on the streets, he, he's he's leading you. you no, know, he's trying to show like, listen, this is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. So I think that uh, he also said that going to the moon would be impossible uh, if if the 234,000 miles away. uh he said you you would need way too much fuel. It'd be way too heavy, and that's impossible for you guys to go to the moon. And then what do you see? Them doing a fake moon landing. So it's really interesting. Uh, so another thing I thought was interesting, remember I was talking about the three heavens. Um, so one is where the moon, sun, and the stars are located. The second heaven would be the firmament. The third heaven would be where God's throne is located. So Paul talks about going up to the third heaven. Um, so second Corinthians 12 verses two through four, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell whether out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth he who was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, don't you think that if Paul was caught up to the third heaven and he got caught up through the globe earth? And through the space, through a, and he saw all these galaxies and everything moving, and and they just got caught up to the third heaven, way far from the earth. I think that he would probably mention to us, not like I there's there, I heard unspeakable words, it's unlawful for man to utter, but he would probably tell us that I, I saw this galaxy, I saw this. You know, it would probably be such a he'd probably write a whole book of the Bible on on what he went through to travel to the heaven if it was what they say it is. But no, it just sounds like he got caught up. To the third heaven if, if this is going to be on video at all if this was like flat right and there's a dome uh up is one way and down is one way but if you are a rotating earth uh we don't even know which way is up we know which way is down it'd be like in the earth but which way is up we don't know but the language in the bible is caught up in the paradise um if you look at where ezekiel i'm sorry um enoch in the bible in genesis he got caught up to heaven uh, also uh you know any any time that jesus when he goes he goes up to heaven elijah he got caught up to heaven because heaven is up when you were a kid i don't know where did you think heaven was located when you were a kid before you got indoctrinated by science you think that oh. heaven is up where do you yeah. think hell was located before you got indoctrinated by science down 
in the earth, yeah. right? And it's really crazy because the Bible, that's the language that the Bible uses. And that's what you naturally thought, uh, you know, as, when you learned about the Bible as a kid, that heaven is up, God is up there, you could see him. Uh, you know, when they talked about him riding in on a cloud, that was no problem for you when you were a kid. Now that you're indoctrinated, you, you just wouldn't even believe it. So very interesting. Uh, so there's caught up to heaven. So heaven is up, hell is down. We know that from the language in the Bible, right? So, and then another thing I thought was interesting was when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, it says that there was a voice from heaven, which was above. So Matthew 3, 16 through 17, it says, and then Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the voice was local, you know? Uh, the the voice was not from trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions of miles away. When when God was speaking, God the Father sent His Holy Spirit down to Jesus, who was on the earth. They heard a voice from heaven, right? And uh, it was a close, local voice. Another time was Second Peter one seventeen. For when He received the honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. He, they heard the voice from heaven. God was speaking. He's not trillions upon trillions upon trillions of miles away. So the reason why I know that as well is because of what you were going over earlier. I think you said you tell, you talked to your daughter. You told them that God is looking down on us like grasshoppers, right? So yeah. uh, the, the, what, where we got that from is uh, Isaiah 40, 22. And this is the verse that a lot of people that believe in the globe or the sphere uh, or the oblique spheroid, whatever you, or the pair, whatever you want to call the earth, because they cut all these different names for it. Uh, Isaiah 40, 21, uh, 22, it says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood the from the foundations of the earth? It is he, speaking of God, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. First of all, the, t the back then the tents were a dome. Second of all, he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So the firmament is stretched out, right? Um, and it, it talks about the inhabitants. He's looking down as like the circle of the earth. If you look what the hat at the, if you took the flat earth and, he, and you look at what it looks like, it, it is actually a circle, right? And if there, if God is above the firmament, he's looking down on us like grasshoppers. It makes perfect sense that he's looking at us. Uh, he sits upon the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He can see all of us like grasshoppers. He's omnipresent. He can see all of us. Uh, it's really interesting. And it says that he stretches out the firmament like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. When I was in the army, a tent was only placed on a flat surface. I never placed the tent on a ball and then slept on it all night. Doesn't work. The tent is placed on a flat surface. The the, the dome is placed on a flat surface. That's just the way it is. And, and it, it really works out. Well, when you think about it, also when he talks about the circle, that word is not sphere in in the in the Hebrew or the Greek. They use the word circle, right? It's not um, a globe. It's not a ball. Uh, the reason why I know that is because in I the author clearly knows the difference between a ball and a circle. Because in Isaiah twenty two eighteen, he says he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country, and thou shalt die. And there's and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the same as thy Lord's house. So God's looking at us like grasshoppers. It's talking about a ball in, in Isaiah 22, 18, not a, you know, not a circle. So he knows the difference. So he would probably use the word ball in Hebrew for, for globe, not use the word circle. Right. So thought that was very interesting. Um, any questions on any of that stuff, bro? No, it was, it was good. <laughs> So we have that. Uh, we're almost done here. We got probably another maybe like 10 minutes. But Revelation 1, 7 through 8, uh, it says, uh, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Speaking of Jesus. And they also which pi pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Uh, even so, amen, I am the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is which is was and which is come in the Almighty. So every eye will see him. So if you're looking at a globe, a fourth of them would see Jesus coming, you know, and I don't even know how he's going to come on a cloud with all these, you know, rotations and all this crazy orbiting. It's going to be hard for him to land. Can you imagine him on a cloud trying to land on, on the, you know, on the <laughs> earth? 
with all that stuff happening. But no, if it's fixed and immovable and God opens up the heavens like a scroll and Jesus comes in, boom, we're, we're e that's an easy way. And every eye will see because the earth is uh, flat, fixed, immovable. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. So we have that. Uh, earlier, we did talk about uh, God, the heavens departing as a scroll. That's Revelation 6, 13 through 15. It says, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. And as a fig tree cast her untimely figs, she has shaken uh, a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So think about this. So um, the heaven departed like a scroll. So if God opens up the firmament like a scroll, uh, you see Jesus come in. It makes perfect sense. Every eye will see him. Uh, also, it talks about the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Does the stars make sense if you're in a heliocentric globe and the stars are bigger than the sun? Uh, all those stars falling to the earth would make no sense at all. But if they are luminescence lights and there's a and they're in the firmament and they all fell to the earth, very interesting. Another way you could take that is you know in the book of Enoch it talks about the stars being angels. I don't know. And it talks about them moving in, a, you know, it, basically they're in judgment and they have to move a certain way in the sky. I don't know. It's I don't know, man. The Bible doesn't talk about the stars being literal angels, but it does talk about angels being stars. You know what I mean? You see it in the, yeah. in the Bible. So I don't know, man. I don't know if that's the way they worded it or if the stars are angels. Who knows? But it talks about them falling to the earth. So if the stars fell in the heliocentric model, we have way more stuff to worry about than the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. Because if the stars have fallen to the earth in the heliocentric model, bro, that's going to just, those things are hot and they are massive. So you guys got to think about that. So it'd be nothing left. Yeah, nothing left whatsoever, you know. So the way Jesus talks, uh, you know, he, he speaks about it too. Jesus is not allowed to sin, right? So Jesus talks about the stars falling to the earth and the moon giving off her light in Mark 13, 24 through 25. Jesus cannot sin. So Jesus cannot lie. Jesus is the way, the truth, the light. And right here he says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light and the sons of heaven shall, or the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers are, are in heaven shall be shaken. So he's talking about the stars falling from heaven. I thought the closest star was 4.4 light years away. What happened to all that, dude? What happened to the, st the sun and the star being the same? Jesus doesn't say that all the suns are going to fall. It doesn't say all the, all the, or it doesn't talk about the sun being a star. It's separate right there. And also he talks about the stars falling from heaven, which does not make sense in the heliocentric model or in the, in the, uh, doesn't make sense, you know, in, in, in our model. So, um, so we have that, we already talked about, so good news is we already talked about the flood. So that's, that's good. That's a little section I usually go over, but we kind of went over that already. Um, so, and, and this, this whole thing would work, you know, I mean, so we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide, the, the trees breathe in carbon dioxide, breathe out oxygen. So that's perfect. We have the water cycle, all this stuff could work in a closed system. Um, it's, it, it would all work. It's, it's fine. It does. It's not like, you know, what do we see? We see like, um, what is that called? Like, uh, uh, you know, when we, we grow plants, we put them in a, a dome. Like a terrarium or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it would all work, man. It would all work. So I think I think it's it's very interesting. Uh, God, I mean, the devil, he knows that, uh, you know, the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. So he just wants to take away your faith. So we got to understand when I'm going through all this stuff that what the Bible is saying is, you know, we, we let God be truth. And every man a liar. Understand that. That's, that's, uh, that's one of the verses I didn't get to go over in the beginning, but... God be truth and every man a liar. So when men are trying to teach you, especially men that have only been on the earth for 60 years, some scientists acting like he knows more than God, God would smack these people down. I'm not saying that he, he would smack them literally, but he would smack them down like he did to Job where he was like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I bind Pallades, when I created the stars, the moon, where were you? You know, you were not even thought of, you know? So when you're a scientist trying to go against God, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God and I'm trying to teach all this stuff. You got to understand where were you when God created the heavens and the earth? You were not even thought of. You were nothing. You were just, you weren't even in swimming in your dad's, you know, you weren't semen yet. So when you're trying to act like you know more than God and, you know, you guys got to understand that God would tell you 
Where were you when I created the foundation, laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I created the firmament? Where were you? You know, it's, it's like, it just baffles me that people think that they can outsmart God. Uh, so that's pretty much my whole thing in a nutshell, besides in the end, where I like to go over this part, this part's interesting. But before I start, do you have any questions on anything I went over so far? No, I was going to say, um, you know, just I, like when I think about God's creation, it really like I just I'm in awe, like even at the human body, like the nervous system, you know, your vasculars, like everything oh, is so like it's mind boggling. You know, God's his creation truly is magnificent. You know, it, it blows my mind. Yes. And, and actually in the Bible, this is the interesting part. It says in first Colossians uh, 15 through 18, it's talking about uh, he who is the image of the invisible God. Uh, it's talking about Jesus. Everything was created by him, through him and for him. Right. So God used the word, which it talks about, in the, you know, uh, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. So God spoke the word, which you mean he used Jesus to create. You know, it's it gets really interesting, man. And it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So we're actually made in the image of Jesus. Right. So we got to understand that. So uh, and Jesus is the word. So God spoke things into existence and that's the way it was so i think that and and like you said man just looking into the intricate details of the human anatomy is is it will blow you away dna you know languages like if if, if i told you that where did the english language come from oh it just came out of nowhere no you would you would you would say oh that came from uh creation someone had to create that language someone created spanish someone created english right so think about it what happened? What about the DNA information, which is like language that's way more intricate than anything we know in this entire uh, realm, you know, of, of, you know, the DNA information, where to come from, there had to be a creator of it. So yeah, it gets, like you said, man, very intricate. So we have, uh, this is interesting. Second Thessalonians 2 11, it says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Right. So there's strong delusion. Uh, Jesus says, do not be deceived. A, a lot of times in the Bible, we need to understand not to be deceived. But I thought that was interesting that uh, it says God shall send them strong delusion. Maybe the st strong delusion is like they say, like they say the aliens and all that crazy stuff. Well, maybe it's the heliocentric model. Maybe it is the Big Bang. Maybe it is evolution. Maybe he's sending all this stuff to test your faith to see if you believe the word of God or you believe man. Who knows, man? God could have sent that, that strong delusion. Uh, I think it gets interesting, but let's go over the how everything uh, in the heliocentric model kind of connects to 666. Uh, we have uh, every one mile is eight inches squared. That's a curvature calculator. And if you take uh, eight divided by 12, it's 0.66 of a foot. So one mile is 0.66 of a foot. 10 miles is 6.66 of a foot or 66.6 of a foot. And if you go 100 miles, it's 6,666. Uh, and then also you have... Um, the sun rotating, orbiting the the sun, or the Earth or, or, or orbiting the sun at sixty six thousand six hundred miles an hour. We have six 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 there. We have the Earth's circumference in nautical miles is six hundred times six times six. So we have that. Um, the Earth is uh, at a twenty three point four axis. So that's if you subtract it from ninety degrees, that's sixty six point six. Isaac Newton came up with the theory of gravity. He started writing it in sixteen sixty six. Uh, the speed of sound is equal to 666 knots. The diameter of the moon is 6 times 6 times 60, which is 2160. Uh, we have the distance of the moon is 6 times 6 uh, times 666. Uh, the the Antarctic, Antarctic, Antarctic celestial sphere is at 66.6 .6 degrees north latitude, 66.6 .6 degrees south latitude. And then the surface of Uranus, not Mayanus, is negative 6 times 6 times 6 degrees. So we got 666, and there's actually more. I just don't go over all of them because, you know, just for time constraint. I usually like to keep this to like about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 30 minutes. Um, yeah, so that all those sixes involved in the heliocentric model, they're just putting it right in front of our face of who is in charge of that model compared to who, you know, who we worship, you know? Um, 100%. Yeah, I like to end it with this. This is what I like to end it with. Genesis 2, verses 1 through 4. Um, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. 
And on the seventh day, God entered his work, which he had done, and he had rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because uh, he rested from his work, which God had created and made. Okay, so it said, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in that day, in, in the day that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens. So it says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. This is the way God made it. God told Moses this is the way I made it. So that's the history of how everything was created. Also, it talks about the heavens and the earth were finished, right? So he's done. He already created it. He's good. Now understand this, that in Revelation, God talks about making a new heaven and a new earth. So why would God have to create a new earth or new heaven? Uh, all he would have to create is a new earth. The reason why he creates both is because they're connected. The heaven and the earth are connected by a firmament and God's throne is above that. So that's why he has to create a new heaven and a new earth. And it talks about God's heaven coming down to earth and God walking amongst, amongst us in, in, in Revelation. If you read it, the very end, Revelation like 22, read it. Why does God have to create a new heaven and a new earth if the earth is orbiting the sun and the moon, sun, and the stars are here and the firmament is way trillions upon trillions of miles away? All he would have to create is a new earth not a new heaven as well, right? Think about that. So, and also it's finished. So God is done. There's not like, you know, people say, well, there's new stars being formed every day. There's this, there's this. It's like, God is done. He said it is finished. So just understand that he rested on the seventh day and it's finished. So that's my whole um, presentation, man. My whole presentation. I, in a nutshell. I loved it. Man. It was great. I appreciate it, brother. Well, thank you, man, for having me. On the show, make sure you guys give them a five-star review on Apple and on Spotify. And then when you create a YouTube, you know, subscribe to the YouTube and all that stuff. And and uh, that way, you know, you get your show rolling. Yep. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're glad you guys came. Thanks, Josh. No problem, brother. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, my podcast is Josh Monday Christian and Conspiracy Podcast. If you want to look it up on YouTube, it's Josh Monday Music and Podcast. And thank you guys so much. And God bless you.